Epilogue of the Borges of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Borges Epilogue There was once in Paris, says Boccaccio, a brave and good merchant named Jean de Sevigny, who did a great trade in drapery and was connected in business with a neighbor and fellow merchant, a very rich man named Abraham, who, though a Jew, enjoyed a good reputation. Jean de Sevigny, appreciating the qualities of the worthy Israelite, feared lest, good man as he was, his false religion would bring his soul straight to eternal perdition. So he began to urge him gently as a friend to renounce his errors and open his eyes to the Christian faith, which he could see for himself was prospering and spreading day by day, being the only true and good religion. Whereas his own creed, it was very plain, was so quickly diminishing that it would soon disappear from the face of the earth. The Jew replied that, except in his own religion, there was no salvation, that he was born in it, proposed to live and die in it, and that he knew nothing in the world that could change his opinion. Still, in his proselytizing fervor, Jean would not think himself beaten, and never a day passed but he demonstrated with those fair words the merchant uses to seduce a customer the superiority of the Christian religion above the Jewish, and although Abraham was a great master of Mosaic law, he began to enjoy his friend's preaching either because of the friendship he felt for him or because the Holy Ghost descended upon the tongue of the new apostle. Still obstinate in his own belief, he would not change. The more he persisted in his error, the more excited was Jean about converting him, so that at last, by God's help, being somewhat shaken by his friend's urgency, Abraham one day said, "'Listen, John, since you have it so much at heart that I should be converted, Behold me disposed to satisfy you, but before I go to Rome to see him who you call God's vicar on earth, I must study his manner of life and his morals, as also those of his brethren the cardinals, and if, as I doubt not, they are in harmony with what you preach, I will admit that, as you have taken such pains to show me, your faith is better than mine, and I will do as you desire. But if it should prove otherwise, I shall remain a Jew, as I was before, for it is not worth while at my age to change my belief for a worse one. Jean was very sad when he heard these words, and he said mournfully to himself, "'Now I have lost my time and pains, which I thought I had spent so well when I was hoping to convert this unhappy Abraham. For if he unfortunately goes, as he says he will, to the court of Rome, and there sees the shameful life led by the servants of the church, instead of becoming a Christian, the Jew will be more of a Jew than ever.' Then turning to Abraham, he said, "'Ah, my friend!' Why do you wish to incur such fatigue and expense by going to Rome, besides the fact that traveling by sea or by land must be very dangerous for so rich a man as you are? Do you suppose there is no one here to baptize you? If you have any doubts concerning the faith, I have expounded where better than here will you find theologians capable of contending with them and delaying them. So you see, this voyage seems to me quite unnecessary. Just imagine that the priests there are such as you see here, and all the better in that they are nearer to the supreme pastor. If you are guided by my advice, you will postpone this toil till you have committed some grave sin and need absolution. Then you and I will go together. But the Jew replied, I believe, dear Jean, that everything is as you tell me, but you know how obstinate I am. I will go to Rome or I will never be a Christian. Then Jean, seeing his great wish, resolved that it was no use trying to thwart him, and wished him good luck, but in his heart he gave up all hope, for it was certain that his friend would come back from his pilgrimage more of a Jew than ever, if the court of Rome was still as he had seen it. But Abraham mounted his horse, and at his best speed took the road to Rome, where on his arrival he was wonderfully well received by his co-religionists, and after staying there a good long time he began to study the behavior of the Pope, the cardinals, and other prelates and of the whole court. But much to his surprise he found out, partly by what passed under his eyes, and partly by what he was told, that all from the Pope downward to the lowest sacristan of St. Peter's were committing the sins of luxurious living in a most disgraceful and unbridled manner, with no remorse and no shame, so that pretty women and handsome youths could obtain any favors they pleased. In addition to this sensuality which they exhibited in public, he saw that they were gluttons and drunkards, so much so that they were more the slaves of the belly than are the greediest of animals. When he looked a little farther, he found them so avaricious and fond of money that they sold for hard cash both human bodies and divine offices, and with less conscience than a man in Paris would sell cloth or any other merchandise. Seeing this, and much more, that 
it would not be proper to set down here it seemed to abraham himself a chaste sober and upright man that he had seen enough so he resolved to return to paris and carried out the resolution with his usual promptitude jean de sevigny held a great fete in honor of his return although he had lost hope of his coming back converted but he left time for him to settle down before he spoke of anything thinking there would be plenty of time to hear the bad news he expected but after a few days of rest abraham himself came to see his friend and jean ventured to ask what he thought of the holy father the cardinals and the other persons at the pontifical court at these words the jew exclaimed god damn them all i never once succeeded in finding among them any holiness any devotion any good works but on the contrary luxurious living avarice greed fraud envy pride and even worse if there is worse all the machines seem to be set in motion by an impulse less divine than diabolical after what i saw it is my firm conviction that your pope and of course the others as well are using all their talents art endeavors to banish the christian religion from the face of the earth though they ought to be its foundation and support and since in spite of all the care and trouble they expend to arrive at this end i see that your religion is spreading every day and becoming more brilliant and more pure it is borne in upon me that the holy spirit himself protects it as the only true and the most holy religion this is why deaf as you found me to your counsel and rebellious to your wish i am now ever since i returned from this sodom firmly resolved on becoming a christian so let us go at once to the church for i am quite ready to be baptized there is no need to say if jean de sevigny who expected a refusal was pleased at this consent without delay he went with his godson to notre dame in paris where he prayed the first priest he met to administer baptism to his friend and this was speedily done and the new convert changed his jewish name of abraham into the christian name of jean and as the neophyte thanks to his journey to rome had gained a profound belief his natural good qualities increased so greatly in the practice of our holy religion that after leading an exemplary life he died in the full odor of sanctity this tale of boccaccio's gives so admirable an answer to the charge of irreligion which some might make against us if they mistook our intentions that as we shall not offer any other reply we have not hesitated to present it entire as it stands to the eyes of our readers and let us never forget that if the papacy has had an innocent the eighth and an alexander the sixth who are its shame it has also had a pious the seventh and a gregory the sixteenth who are its honor and glory end of the epilogue of the borgias recording by john van stan savannah georgia section twenty of celebrated crimes volume one by alexander dumas Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one of the Cenci, 1598. Should you ever go to Rome and visit the Villa Pamphili, no doubt, after having sought under its tall pines and along its canals the shade and freshness so rare in the capital of the Christian world, you will descend towards Janiculum Hill by a charming road, in the middle of which you will find the Pauline Fountain. Having passed this monument, and having lingered a moment on the terrace of the church of St. Peter Montorio, which commands the whole of Rome, you will visit the cloister of Bramante, in the middle of which, sunk a few feet below the level, is built on the identical place where St. Peter was crucified, a little temple, half Greek, half Christian. You will thence ascend by a side door into the church itself. There the attentive Cicerone will show you, in the first chapel to the right, the Christ scourged by Sebastian del Piombo, and in the third chapel to the left, an entombment by a fiamingo. Having examined these two masterpieces at leisure, he will take you to each end of the transverse cross, and will show you, on one side a picture by Salviati on slate, and on the other a work by Vissari, then pointing out in melancholy tones a copy of Guido's martyrdom of St. Peter on the high altar, he will relate to you how for three centuries the divine Raphael's transfiguration was worshipped in that spot how it was carried away by the french in eighteen o nine and restored to the pope by the allies in eighteen fourteen as you have already in all probability admired this masterpiece in the vatican allow him to expatiate and search at the foot of the altar for a mortuary slab which you will identify by a cross and a single word orate under this gravestone is buried a beatrice sensi whose tragical story cannot but impress you profoundly she was the daughter of francesco sensi 
whether or not it be true that men are born in harmony with their epoch and that some embody its good qualities and others its bad ones, it may nevertheless interest our readers to cast a rapid glance over the period which had just passed when the events which we are about to relate took place. Francesco Sensi will then appear to them as the diabolical incarnation of his time. On the 11th of August, 1492, after the lingering death agony of Innocent VIII, during which 220 murders were committed in the streets of Rome, Alexander the Sixth ascended the pontifical throne, son of a sister of Pope Calixtus III, Rodrigo Lenzuoli Borgia, before being created cardinal, had five children by Rosa Venozza, whom he afterwards caused to be married to a rich Roman. These children were Francis, Duke of Gandia, Caesar, Bishop and Cardinal, afterwards Duke of Valentinois, Lucrezia, who was married four times. Her first husband was Giovanni Sforza, Lord of Pesaro, whom she left owing to his impotence, the second Alfonso, Duke of Bisiglia, whom her brother Caesar caused to be assassinated, the third Alfonso d'Este, Duke of Ferrara, from whom a second divorce separated her, finally the fourth, Alfonso of Aragon, who was stabbed to death on the steps of the Basilica of St. Peter, and afterwards, three weeks later, strangled because he did not die soon enough from his wounds, which nevertheless were mortal. Geoffrey, Count of Squillace, of whom little is known, and finally a youngest son of whom nothing at all is known. The most famous of these three brothers was Caesar Borgia. He had made every arrangement a plotter could make to be king of Italy at the death of his father the Pope, and his measures were so carefully taken as to leave no doubt in his own mind as to the success of this vast project. Every chance was provided against except one, but Satan himself could hardly have foreseen this particular one, or the reader will judge for himself. The Pope had invited Cardinal Adrian to supper in his vineyard on the Belvedere. Cardinal Adrian was very rich, and the Pope wished to inherit his wealth, as he had already acquired that of the Cardinals of St. Angelo, Capua, and Modena. To effect this, Caesar Borgia sent two bottles of poisoned wine to his father's cupbearer. Without taking him into his confidence, he only instructed him not to serve this wine till he himself gave orders to do so. Unfortunately, during supper the cupbearer left his post for a moment, and in this interval a careless butler served the poisoned wine to the Pope, to Caesar Borgia, and to Cardinal Corneto. Alexander the Sixth died some hours afterwards, Caesar Borgia was confined to bed, and sloughed off his skin, while Cardinal Corneto lost his sight and his senses and was brought to death's door. Pius III succeeded Alexander the Sixth and reigned twenty-five days. On the twenty-sixth he was poisoned also. Caesar Borgia had under his control eighteen Spanish cardinals who owed to him their places in the sacred college. These cardinals were entirely his creatures, and he could command them absolutely. As he was in a moribund condition and could make no use of them for himself, he sold them to Giuliano della Rovere, and Giuliano della Rovere was elected pope under the name of Julius II. Uh, to the Rome of Nero succeeded the Athens of Pericles. Leo X succeeded Julius II, and under his pontificate Christianity assumed a pagan character which, passing from art into manners, gives to this epoch a strange complexion. Crimes for the moment disappeared to give place to vices, but to charming vices, vices in good taste, such as those indulged in by Alcibiades and sung by Catullus. Leo X died after having assembled under his reign, which lasted eight years, eight months, and nineteen days, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Correggio, Titian, Andrea da Sorto, Fra Bartolomeo, Giulio Romano, Ariasto, Gicciardini, and Machiavelli. Giulio de' Medici and Pompeo Colonna had equal claims to succeed him, as both were skillful politicians, experienced courtiers, and moreover of real and almost equal merit, neither of them could obtain a majority, and the conclave was prolonged almost indefinitely to the great fatigue of the cardinals. So it happened one day that a cardinal more tired than the rest proposed to elect, instead of either Medici or Colonna, the son, some say of a weaver, others of a brewer of Utrecht, of whom no one had ever thought till then, and was for the moment acting head of affairs in Spain, in the absence of Charles V. The jest prospered in the ears of those who heard it, all the cardinals approved their colleague's proposal, and Hadrian became pope by a mere accident. He was a perfect specimen of the Flemish type, a regular Dutchman, and could not speak a word of Italian. When he arrived in Rome and saw the Greek masterpieces of sculpture collected at vast cost by Leo X, he wished to break them to pieces, exclaiming, Sua de dola anticorum! His first act was to dispatch a papal nuncio, Francesco Cerigato, to the Diet of Nuremberg, convened to discuss the reforms of Luther, with instructions which give a vivid notion of the manners of the time. Candidly confess, said he, that God has permitted this schism and this persecution on account of the sins of man, 
especially those of priests and prelates of the church, for we know that many abominable things have taken place in the Holy See. Adrian wished to bring the Romans back to the simple and austere manners of the early church, and with this object pushed reform to the minutest details. For instance, of the hundred grooms maintained by Leo X, he retained only a dozen, in order, he said, to have two more than the cardinals. A pope like this could not reign long. He died after a year's pontificate. The morning after his death, his physician's door was found decorated with garlands of flowers, bearing this inscription, To the liberator of his country. Giulio de' Medici and Pompeo Colonna were again rival candidates. Intrigues recommenced, and the conclave was once more so divided that at one time the cardinals thought they could only escape the difficulty in which they were placed by doing what they had done before and electing a third competitor. They were even talking about Cardinal Orsini, when Giulio de' Medici, one of the rival candidates, hit upon a very ingenious expedient. He wanted only five votes. Five of his partisans each offered to bet five of Colonna's a hundred thousand ducats to ten thousand against the election of Giulio de' Medici. At the very first ballot, after the wager, Giulio de' Medici got the five votes he wanted. No objection could be made. The cardinals had not been bribed. They had made a bet. That was all. Thus it happened. On the 18th of November, 1523, Giulio de' Medici was proclaimed pope under the name of Clement VII. The same day, he generously paid the 500,000 ducats which his five partisans had lost. It was under this pontificate, and during the seven months in which Rome, conquered by the Lutheran soldiers of the Constable of Bourbon, saw all holy things subjected to the most frightful profanations, that Francesco Sensi was born. He was the son of Monsignor Niccolo Sensi, afterwards apostolic treasurer during the pontificate of Pius V, under this venerable prelate, who occupied himself much more with the spiritual than the temporal administration of his kingdom, Niccolo Sensi took advantage of his spiritual head's abstraction of worldly matters to amass a net revenue of 160,000 piastres, about 32,000 francs of our money. Francesco Sensi, who was his only son, inherited this fortune. His youth was spent under popes so occupied with the schism of Luther that they had no time to think of anything else. The result was that Francesco Sensi, inheriting vicious instincts and a master of an immense fortune which enabled him to purchase immunity, abandoned himself to all the evil passions of his fiery and passionate temperament. Five times during his profligate career imprisoned for abominable crimes, he only succeeded in procuring his liberation by the payment of 200,000 piastres, or about one million francs. It should be explained that popes at this time were in great need of money. The lawless profligacy of Francesco Sensi first began seriously to attract public attention under the pontificate of Gregory the Thirteenth. This reign offered marvelous facilities for the development of a reputation such as that which this reckless Italian Don Juan seemed bent on acquiring. Under the Bolognese, Buon Campagno, a free hand, was given to those able to pay both assassins and judges. Rape and murder were so common that public justice scarcely troubled itself with these trifling things if nobody appeared to prosecute the guilty parties. The good Gregory had his reward for his easy-going indulgence, as he was spared to rejoice over the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Francesco Sensi was at the time of which we are speaking a man of forty-four or forty-five years of age, about five feet four inches in height, symmetrically proportioned and very strong, although rather thin. His hair was streaked with grey, his eyes were large and expressive, although the upper eyelids drooped somewhat. His nose was long, his lips were thin, and wore habitually a pleasant smile, except when his eye perceived an enemy. At this moment his features assumed a terrible expression. On such occasions, and whenever moved or even slightly irritated, he was seized with a fit of nervous trembling which lasted long after the cause which provoked it had passed. An adept in all manly exercises, and especially in horsemanship, he sometimes used to ride without stopping from Rome to Naples, a distance of forty-one leagues. Passing through the forest of San Germano and the Pontine marshes, heedless of brigands, although he might be alone and unarmed save for his sword and dagger, when his horse fell from fatigue he bought another. Were the owner unwilling to sell it, he took it by force. If resistance were made, he struck and always with the point, never the hilt. In most cases, being well known throughout the Papal States as a free-handed person, nobody tried to thwart him, some yielding through fear, others from motives of interest. Impious, sacrilegious, and atheistical, he never entered a church except to profane its sanctity. It was said of him that he had a morbid appetite for novelties and crime, and that there was no outrage he would not commit if he hoped by doing so to enjoy a new sensation. At the age of about forty-five he had married a very rich woman, 
whose name is not mentioned by any chronicler. She died, leaving him seven children, five boys and two girls. He then married Lucrezia Petroni, a perfect beauty of the Roman type, except for the ivory pallor of her complexion. By this second marriage he had no children. As if Francesco Sensi were void of all natural affection, he hated his children, and was at no pains to conceal his feelings towards them. On one occasion, when he was building in the courtyard of his magnificent palace near the Tiber a chapel dedicated to St. Thomas, he remarked to the architect, when instructing him to design a family vault, "'That is where I hope to bury them all!' The architect often subsequently admitted that he was so terrified by the fiendish laugh which accompanied these words that had not Francesco Sensi's work been extremely profitable, he would have refused to go on with it. As soon as his three eldest boys, Giacomo, Cristoforo, and Rocco, were out of their tutor's hands in order to get rid of them, he sent them to the University of Salamanca, where, out of sight, they were out of mind, for he thought no more about them and did not even send them the means of subsistence. In these straits, after struggling for some months against their wretched plight, the lads were obliged to leave Salamanca and beg their way home, tramping barefoot through France and Italy, till they made their way back to Rome, where they found their father harsher and more unkind than ever. This happened in the early part of the reign of Clement the Eighth, famed for his justice. The three youths resolved to apply to him, to grant them an allowance out of their father's immense income. They consequently repaired to Frascati, where the Pope was building the beautiful Albo Brandini villa and stated their case. The Pope admitted the justice of their claims and ordered Francesco to allow each of them two thousand crowns a year. He endeavored by every possible means to evade this decree, but the Pope's orders were too stringent to be disobeyed. About this period he was for the third time imprisoned for infamous crimes. His three sons then again petitioned the Pope, alleging that their father dishonored the family name and praying that the extreme rigor of the law, a capital sentence, should be enforced in his case. The Pope pronounced this conduct unnatural and odious, and drove them with ignominy from his presence. As for Francesco, he escaped, as on the two previous occasions, by the payment of a large sum of money. It will be readily understood that his son's conduct on this occasion did not improve their father's disposition towards them, but as their independent pensions enabled them to keep out of his way, his rage fell with all the greater intensity on his two unhappy daughters. Their situation soon became so intolerable that the elder, contriving to elude the close supervision under which she was kept, forwarded to the Pope a petition, relating the cruel treatment to which she was subjected, and praying His Holiness either to give her in marriage or place her in a convent. Clement the Eighth took pity on her, compelled Francesco Sensi to give her a dowry of sixty thousand crowns, and married her to Carlo Gabrielli, of a noble family of Gubbio. Francesco, driven nearly frantic with rage when he saw this victim released from his clutches. About the same time, death relieved him from two other encumbrances. His sons Rocco and Cristoforo were killed within a year of each other, the latter by a bungling medical practitioner whose name is unknown, the former by Paolo Corso di Massa in the streets of Rome. This came as a relief to Francesco, whose avarice pursued his sons even after their death, for he intimated to the priest that he would not spend a farthing on funeral services. They were accordingly borne to the pauper's graves which he had caused to be prepared for them, and when he saw them both interred he cried out that he was well rid of such good-for-nothing children, but that he should be perfectly happy only when the remaining five were buried with the first two, and that when he had got rid of the last he himself would burn down his palace as a bonfire to celebrate the event. But Francesco took every precaution against his second daughter, Beatrice Sensi, following the example of her elder sister. She was then a child of twelve or thirteen years of age, beautiful and innocent as an angel. Her long, fair hair, a beauty seen so rarely in Italy, that Raphael, believing it divine, has appropriated it to all his Madonnas, curtained a lovely forehead and fell in flowing locks over her shoulders. Her azure eyes bore a heavenly expression. She was of middle height, exquisitely proportioned, and during the rare moments when a gleam of happiness allowed her natural character to display itself, she was lively, joyous, and sympathetic, but at the same time evinced a firm and decided disposition. To make sure of her custody, Francesco kept her shut up in a remote apartment of his palace, the key of which he kept in his own possession. There her unnatural and inflexible jailer daily brought her some food. Up to the age of thirteen, which she had now reached, he had behaved to her with the most extreme harshness and severity. But now, to poor Beatrice's great astonishment, he all at once became gentle and even tender. Beatrice was a child no longer. 
her beauty expanded like a flower, and Francesco, a stranger to no crime, however heinous, had marked her for his own. Brought up as she had been, uneducated, deprived of all society, even that of her stepmother, Beatrice knew not good from evil. Her ruin was comparatively easy to compass. Yet Francesco, to accomplish his diabolical purpose, employed all the means at his command. Every night she was awakened by a concert of music which seemed to come from paradise. When she mentioned this to her father, he left her in this belief, adding that if she proved gentle and obedient, she would be rewarded by heavenly sights as well as heavenly sounds. One night it came to pass that as the young girl was reposing, her head supported on her elbow and listening to a delightful harmony, the chamber door suddenly opened, and from the darkness of her own room she beheld a suite of apartments brilliantly illuminated and sensuous with perfumes. Beautiful youths and girls, half-clad such as she had seen in the pictures of Guido and Raphael, moved to and fro in these apartments, seeming full of joy and happiness. These were the ministers to the pleasures of Francesco, who, rich as a king, every night reveled in the orgies of Alexander, or the wedding revels of Lucrezia, and the excesses of Tiberius at Capri. After an hour the door closed, and the seductive vision vanished, leaving Beatrice full of trouble and amazement. The night following the same apparition again presented itself, only on this occasion Francesco Sensi, undressed, entered his daughter's room and invited her to join the fete. Hardly knowing what she did, Beatrice yet perceived the impropriety of yielding to her father's wishes. She replied that, not seeing her stepmother, Lucrezia Petroni, among all these women, she dared not leave her bed to mix with persons who were unknown to her. Francesco threatened and prayed, but threats and prayers were of no avail. Beatrice wrapped herself up in the bedclothes and obstinately refused to obey. The next night she threw herself on her bed without undressing. At the accustomed hour the door opened and the nocturnal spectacle reappeared. This time Lucrezia Petroni was among the women who passed before Beatrice's door. Violence had compelled her to undergo this humiliation. Beatrice was too far off to see her blushes and her tears. Francesco pointed out her stepmother, whom she had looked for in vain the previous evening, and as she could no longer make any opposition, he led her, covered with blushes and confusion, into the middle of this orgy. Beatrice there saw incredible and infamous things. Nevertheless, she resisted a long time. An inward voice told her that this was horrible. But Francesco had the slow persistence of a demon. To these sights, calculated to stimulate her passions, he added heresies designed to warp her mind. He told her that the greatest saints venerated by the church were the issue of fathers and daughters. And in the end, Beatrice committed a crime without even knowing it to be a sin. His brutality then knew no bounds. He forced Lucrezia and Beatrice to share the same bed, threatening his wife to kill her if she disclosed to his daughter by a single word that there was anything odious in such an intercourse. So matters went on for about three years. At this time Francesco was obliged to make a journey and leave the women alone and free. The first thing Lucrezia did was to enlighten Beatrice on the infamy of the life they were leading. They then together prepared a memorial to the Pope in which they laid before him a statement of all the blows and outrages they had suffered. But before leaving, Francesco Sensi had taken precautions. Every person about the Pope was in his pay or hoped to be. The petition never reached His Holiness, and the two poor women, remembering that Clement VIII had on a former occasion driven Giacomo, Cristoforo, and Rocco from his presence, thought they were included in the same prescription and looked upon themselves as abandoned to their fate. When matters were in this state, Giacomo, taking advantage of his father's absence, came to pay them a visit with his friend, an abbe named Guerra. He was a young man of twenty-five or twenty-six, belonging to one of the most noble families in Rome of a bold, resolute, and courageous character, and idolized by all the Roman ladies for his beauty. To classical features he added blue eyes swimming in poetic sentiment. His hair was long and fair, with chestnut beard and eyebrows. Add to these attractions a highly educated mind, natural eloquence expressed by a musical and penetrating voice, and the reader may form some idea of Monsignor the Abbe Guerra. No sooner had he seen Beatrice than he fell in love with her. On her side, she was not slow to return the sympathy of the young priest. The Council of Trent had not been held at that time, consequently ecclesiastics were not precluded from marriage. It was therefore decided that on the return of Francesco, the Abbe Guerra should demand the hand of Beatrice from her father, and the women, happy in the absence of their master, continued to live on, hoping for better things to come. After three or four months, during which no one knew where he was, Francesco returned. 
The very first night he wished to resume his intercourse with Beatrice, but she was no longer the same person. The timid and submissive child had become a girl of decided will, strong in her love for the abbe. She resisted alike prayers, threats, and blows. The wrath of Francesco fell upon his wife, whom he accused of betraying him. He gave her a violent thrashing. Lucrezia Petroni was a veritable Roman she-wolf. Passionate alike in love and vengeance, she endured all, but pardoned nothing. Some days after this, the Abbe Guerra arrived at the Sensi Palace to carry out what had been arranged. Rich, young, noble, and handsome, everything would seem to promise him success, yet he was rudely dismissed by Francesco. The first refusal did not daunt him. He returned to the charge a second time, and yet a third, insisting upon the suitableness of such a union. At length, Francesco, losing patience, told this obstinate lover that a reason existed why Beatrice could be neither his wife nor any other man's. Aguera demanded what this reason was. Francesco replied, "'Because she is my mistress.' Monsignor Guerra turned pale at this answer, although at first he did not believe a word of it. But when he saw the smile with which Francesco Sensi accompanied his words, he was compelled to believe that, terrible though it was, the truth had been spoken. For three days he sought an interview with Beatrice in vain. At length he succeeded in finding her. His last hope was her denial of this horrible story. Beatrice confessed all. Henceforth there was no human hope for the two lovers. An impassable gulf separated them. They parted bathed in tears, promising to love one another always. Up to that time the two women had not formed any criminal resolution, and possibly the tragical incident might never have happened, had not Francis one night returned into his daughter's room and violently forced her into the commission of a fresh crime. Henceforth, the doom of Francesco was irrevocably pronounced. End of Part 1 of The Sensi Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Section 21 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of The Sensi As we have said, the mind of Beatrice was susceptible to the best and the worst influences. It could attain excellence and descend to guilt. She went and told her mother of the fresh outrage she had undergone. This roused in the heart of the other woman the sting of her own wrongs, and stimulating each other's desire for revenge, they decided upon the murder of Francesco. Guerra was called in to this council of death. His heart was a prey to hatred and revenge. He undertook to communicate with Giacomo Sensi, without whose concurrence the women would not act, as he was the head of the family when his father was left out of account. Giacomo entered readily into the conspiracy. It will be remembered what he had formerly suffered from his father. Since that time he had married, and the close-fisted old man had left him with his wife and children to languish in poverty. Guerra's house was selected to meet in and concert matters. Giacomo hired a Spiro named Marzio, and Guerra a second named Olimpio. Both these men had private reasons for committing the crime, one being actuated by love, uh, the other by hatred. Mazio, who was in the service of Giacomo, had often seen Beatrice and loved her, but with that silent and hopeless love which devours the soul. When he conceived that the proposed crime would draw him nearer to Beatrice, he accepted his part in it without any demur. As for Olimpio, he hated Francesco, because the latter had caused him to lose the post of Castellan of Rocco Petrella, a fortified stronghold in the kingdom of Naples belonging to Prince Colonna. Almost every year, Francesco Sensi spent some months at Rocco Petrella with his family, for Prince Colonna, a noble and magnificent but needy prince, had much esteem for Francesco, whose purse he found extremely useful. It had so happened that Francesco, being dissatisfied with Olimpio, complained about him to Prince Colonna, and he was dismissed. After several consultations between the Sensi family, the Abbey, and the Ispiri, the following plan of action was decided upon. The period when Francesco Sensi was accustomed to go to Rocco Petrella was approaching. It was arranged that Olimpio, conversant with the district and its inhabitants, should collect a party of a dozen Neapolitan bandits and conceal them in a forest through which the travelers would have to pass. Upon a given signal, the whole family were to be seized and carried off. A heavy ransom was to be demanded, and the sons were to be sent back to Rome to raise the sum. But, under pretext of inability to do so, they were to allow the time fixed by the bandits to lapse, when Francesco was to be put to death. 
Thus all suspicions of a plot would be avoided and the real assassins would escape justice. This well-devised scheme was nevertheless unsuccessful. When Francesco left Rome, the scouts sent in advance by the conspirators could not find the bandits. The latter, not being warned beforehand, failed to come down before the passage of the travelers who arrived safe and sound at Rocco Petrella. The bandits, after having patrolled the road in vain, came to the conclusion that their prey had escaped, and unwilling to stay any longer in a place where they had already spent a week, went off in quest of better luck elsewhere. Francesco had in the meantime settled down in the fortress, and to be more free to tyrannize over Lucrezia and Beatrice, sent back to Rome Giacomo and his two other sons. He then recommenced his infamous attempts upon Beatrice, and with such persistence that she resolved herself to accomplish the deed which at first she desired to entrust to other hands. Olympio and Marzio, who had nothing to fear from justice, remained lurking about the castle. One day Beatrice saw them from a window and made signs that she had something to communicate to them. The same night Olympio, who having been a castellan knew all the approaches to the fortress, made his way there with his companion. Beatrice awaited them at a window which looked on to a secluded courtyard. She gave them letters which she had written to her brother and to Monsignor Guerra. The former was to approve, as he had done before, the murder of their father, for she would do nothing without his sanction. As for Monsignor Guerra, he was to pay Olympio a thousand piastres, half the stipulated sum. Mazio, acting out of pure love for Beatrice, whom he worshipped as a Madonna, which observing the girl gave him a handsome scarlet mantle, trimmed with gold lace, telling him to wear it for love of her. As for the remaining moiety, it was to be paid when the death of the old man had placed his wife and daughter in possession of his fortune. The two spieri departed, and the imprisoned conspirators anxiously awaited their return. On the day fixed they were seen again, Monsignor Guerra had paid the thousand piastres, and Giacomo had given his consent. Nothing now stood in the way of the execution of this terrible deed, which was fixed for the 8th of September, the day of the Nativity of the Virgin. But Signora Lucrezia, a very devout person, having noticed this circumstance, would not be a party to the committal of a double sin. The matter was therefore deferred until the next day, the 9th. That evening, the 9th of September, 1598, the two women, supping with the old man, mixed some narcotic with his wine so adroitly that, suspicious though he was, he never detected it, and, having swallowed the potion, soon fell into a deep sleep. The evening previous, Marzio and Olympio had been admitted into the castle, where they had lain concealed all night and all day, for, as will be remembered, the assassination would have been effected the day before had it not been for the religious scruples of Signora Lucrezia Petroni. Towards midnight, Beatrice fetched them out of their hiding place and took them to her father's chamber, the door of which she herself opened. The assassins entered, and the two women awaited the issue in the room adjoining. After a moment, seeing the spieri reappear, pale and nerveless, shaking their heads without speaking, they had once inferred that nothing had been done. "'What's the matter?' cried Beatrice. "'And what hinders you?' "'It is a cowardly act.' replied the assassins, to kill a poor old man in his sleep. At the thought of his age we were struck with pity. Then Beatrice disdainfully raised her head and in a deep, firm voice thus reproached them. Is it possible that you, who pretend to be brave and strong, have not courage enough to kill a sleeping old man? How would it be if he were awake, and thus you steal our money? Very well, since your cowardice compels me to do so, I will kill my father myself, but you will not long survive him. Hearing these words, the Spiri felt ashamed of their irresolution, and indicating by signs that they would fulfill their compact, they entered the room, accompanied by the two women. As they had said, a ray of moonlight shone through the open window and brought into prominence the tranquil face of the old man, the sight of whose white hair had so affected them. This time they showed no mercy. One of them carried two great nails, such as those portrayed in the pictures of the crucifixion. The other bore a mallet. The first placed a nail upright over one of the old man's eyes, the other struck it with the hammer and drove it into his head. The throat was pierced in the same way with the second nail, and thus the guilty soul, stained throughout its career with crimes of violence, was in its turn violently torn from the body which lay writhing on the floor where it had rolled. The young girl, then faithful to her word, handed the spieri a large purse containing the rest of the sum agreed upon, and they left. When they found themselves alone, the women drew the nails out of the wounds wrapped the corpse in a sheet, and dragged it through the rooms toward a small rampart, intending to throw it down into a garden, which had been allowed to run to waste. They hoped that the old man's death would be attributed to his having accidentally fallen off the terrace on his way in the dark to a closet at the end of the gallery. 
but their strength failed them when they reached the door of the last room, and while resting there, Lucrezia perceived the two Spiri sharing the money before making their escape. At her call they came to her, carried the corpse to the rampart, and from a spot pointed out by the women where the terrace was unfenced by any parapet, they threw it into an elder tree below, whose branches retained it suspended. When the body was found, the following morning, hanging in the branches of the elder tree, everyone supposed, as Beatrice and her stepmother had foreseen, that Francesco, stepping over the edge of the 386 terrace in the dark, had thus met his end. The body was so scratched and disfigured that no one noticed the wounds made by the two nails. The ladies, as soon as the news was imparted to them, came out from their rooms, weeping and lamenting in so natural a manner as to disarm any suspicions. The only person who formed any was the laundress to whom Beatrice entrusted the sheet in which her father's body had been wrapped. Accounting for its bloody condition by a lame explanation which the laundress accepted without question, or pretended to do so, and immediately after the funeral, the mourners returned to Rome, hoping at length to enjoy quietude and peace. For some time, indeed, they did enjoy tranquillity, perhaps poisoned by remorse, but ere long retribution pursued them. The court of Naples, hearing of the sudden and unexpected death of Francesco Sensi, and conceiving some suspicions of violence, dispatched a royal commissioner to Petrella to exhume the body and make minute inquiries, if there appeared to be adequate grounds for doing so. On his arrival, all the domestics in the castle were placed under arrest and sent in chains to Naples. No incriminating proofs, however, were found, except in the evidence of the laundress, who deposed that Beatrice had given her a blood-stained sheet to wash. This clue led to terrible consequences, for further questioned she declared that she could not believe the explanation given to account for its condition. The evidence was sent to the Roman court, but at that period it did not appear strong enough to warrant the arrest of the Sensi family, who remained undisturbed for many months, during which time the youngest boy died. Of the five brothers there only remained Giacomo, the eldest, and Bernardo, the youngest, but one. Nothing prevented them from escaping to Venice or Florence, but they remained quietly in Rome. Meantime, Monsignor Guerra received private information that, shortly before the death of Francesco, Mazzio and Olimpio had been seen prowling round the castle, and that the Neapolitan police had received orders to arrest them. The Monsignor was a most wary man, and very difficult to catch napping when warned in time. He immediately hired two other spiri to assassinate Mazzio and Olimpio. The one commissioned to put Olimpio out of the way came across him at Terni, and conscientiously did his work with a poniard. But Marzio's man unfortunately arrived at Naples too late, and found his bird already in the hands of the police. He was put to the torture and confessed everything. His deposition was sent to Rome, whither he shortly afterwards followed it, to be confronted with the accused. Warrants were immediately issued for the arrest of Giacomo, Bernardo, Lucrezia, and Beatrice. They were at first confined in the Sensi Palace under a strong guard, but the proofs against them becoming stronger and stronger, they were removed to the castle of Corte Savella, where they were confronted with Marzio. But they obstinately denied both any complicity in the crime and any knowledge of the assassin. Beatrice, above all, displayed the greatest assurance, demanding to be the first to be confronted with Marzio, whose mendacity she affirmed with such calm dignity that he, more than ever smitten by her beauty, determined since he could not live for her, to save her by his death. Consequently, he declared all his statements to be false and asked forgiveness from God and from Beatrice. Neither threats nor torture could make him recant, and he died firm in his denial under frightful tortures. The sensi then thought themselves safe. God's justice, however, still pursued them. The Spiro, who had killed Olympio, happened to be arrested for another crime, and, making a clean breast, confessed that he had been employed by Monsignor Guerra to put out of the way a fellow assassin named Olympio, who knew too many of the Monsignor's secrets. Luckily for himself, Monsignor Guerra heard of this opportunely. A man of infinite resource, he lost not a moment in timid or irresolute plans, but as it happened that at the very moment when he was warned, the charcoal dealer, who supplied his house with fuel, was at hand, he sent for him purchased his silence with a handsome bribe, and then, buying for almost their weight in gold the dirty clothes which he wore, he assumed these, cut off all his beautiful cherished fair hair, stained his beard, smudged his face, bought two asses, laden with charcoal, and limped up and down the streets of Rome, crying, A charcoal! A charcoal! Then, whilst all the detectives were hunting high and low for him, he got out of the city, met a company of merchants under escort, joined them, and reached Naples, where he embarked. What ultimately became of him was never known. It has been asserted, but without confirmation, that he succeeded in reaching France and enlisted in a Swiss regiment in the pay of Henry the Fourth. 
The confession of the Spiro and the disappearance of Monsignor Guerra left no moral doubt of the guilt of the Sensi. They were consequently sent from the castle to the prison. The two brothers, when put to the torture, broke down and confessed their guilt. Lucrezia Petroni's full habit of body rendered her unable to bear the torture of the rope, and on being suspended in the air begged to be lowered when she confessed all she knew. As for Beatrice, she continued unmoved. Neither promises, threats, nor torture had any effect upon her. She bore everything unflinchingly, and the judge Ulysses Moscati himself, famous though he was in such matters, failed to draw from her a single incriminating word. Unwilling to take any further responsibility, he referred the case to Clement VIII and the Pope, conjecturing that the judge had been too lenient in applying the torture to a young and beautiful Roman lady, took it out of his hands and entrusted it to another judge whose severity and insensibility to emotion were undisputed. This latter reopened the whole interrogatory, and as Beatrice up to that time had only been subjected to the ordinary torture, he gave instructions to apply both the ordinary and extraordinary. This was the rope and pulley, one of the most terrible inventions ever devised by the most ingenious of tormentors. To make the nature of this horrid torture plain to our readers, we give a detailed description of it, adding an extract of the presiding judge's report of the case, taken from the Vatican manuscripts. Of the various forms of torture then used in Rome, the most common were the whistle, the fire, the sleepless, and the rope. The mildest, the torture of the whistle, was used only in the case of children and old persons. It consisted in thrusting between the nails and the flesh reeds cut in the shape of whistles. The fire, frequently employed before the invention of the sleepless torture, was simply roasting the soles of the feet before a hot fire. The sleepless torture, invented by Marsilius, was worked by forcing the accused into an angular frame of wood about five feet high, the sufferer being stripped and his arms tied behind his back to the frame. Two men, relieved every five hours, sat beside him and roused him the moment his eyes closed. Marsilius says he has never found a man of proof against this torture, but here he claims more than he is justly entitled to. Farinacci states that out of one hundred accused persons subjected to it, five only refused to confess. A very satisfactory result for the inventor. Lastly comes the torture of the rope and pulley, the most in vogue of all and known in other Latin countries as the strapado. It was divided into three degrees of intensity, the slight, the severe, and the very severe. The first, or slight torture, which consisted mainly in the apprehensions it caused, comprised the threat of severe torture, introduction to the torture chamber, a stripping and the tying of the rope in readiness for its appliance. To increase the terror these preliminaries excited, a pang of physical pain was added by tightening a cord round the wrists. This often sufficed to extract a confession from women or men of highly strung nerves. The second degree, or severe torture, consisted of fastening the sufferer in, stripped naked, and his hands tied behind his back. By the wrist, to one end of the rope, passed around a pulley bolted into the vaulted ceiling, the other end being attached to a windlass, by turning which he could be hoisted into the air and dropped again either slowly or with a jerk, as ordered by the judge. The suspension generally lasted during the recital of a paternoster, an Ave Maria, or a Miserere. If the accused persisted in his denial, it was doubled. This second degree, the last of the ordinary torture, was put in practice when the crime appeared reasonably probable, but was not absolutely proved. The third, or very severe, the first of the extraordinary forms of torture, was so called when the sufferer, having hung suspended by the wrists for sometimes a whole hour, was swung about by the executioner either like the pendulum of a clock, or by elevating him with the windlass and dropping him to within a foot or two of the ground. If he stood this torture, a thing almost unheard of, seeing that it cut the flesh of the wrist to the bone and dislocated the limbs, weights were attached to the feet, thus doubling the torture. This last form of torture was only applied when an atrocious crime had been proved to have been committed upon a sacred person, such as a priest, a cardinal, a prince, or an eminent and learned man. Having seen that Beatrice was sentenced to the torture ordinary and extraordinary, and having explained the nature of these tortures, we proceed to quote the official report— and as in reply to every question she would confess nothing, we caused her to be taken by two officers and led from the prison to the torture chamber, where the torturer was in attendance. There, after cutting off her hair, he made her sit on a small stool, undressed her, pulled off her shoes, tied her hands behind her back, fastened them to a rope passed over a pulley bolted to the ceiling of the aforesaid chamber, and wound up at the other end by a four-lever windlass worked by two men. 
Before hoisting her from the ground, we again interrogated her, uh, touching the aforesaid parricide, but notwithstanding the confessions of her brother and her stepmother, which were again produced, uh, bearing their signatures, she persisted in denying everything said. "'Haul me about and do whatever you like with me. I have spoken the truth and will tell you nothing else, even if I were torn to pieces.' Upon this we had her hoisted in the air by the wrist to the height of about two feet from the ground, while we recited a pater noster, and then again questioned her as to the facts and circumstances of the aforesaid parricide. But she would make no further answer, only saying, "'You are killing me! You are killing me!' We then raised her to the elevation of four feet and began an Ave Maria, but before our prayer was half finished she fainted away or pretended to do so. We caused a bucket full of water to be thrown over her head. Feeling its coolness, she recovered consciousness and cried, "'My God, I am dead! You are killing me! My God!' But this was all she would say. We then raised her higher still and recited a miserere, during which, instead of joining in the prayer, she shook convulsively and cried several times, "'My God! My God!' Again, questioned as to the aforesaid parricide, she would confess nothing, saying only that she was innocent, and then again fainted away. We caused more water to be thrown over her, then she recovered her senses, opened her eyes, and cried, "'Oh, cursed executioners! You are killing me! You are killing me!' But nothing more would she say. A seeing which, in that she persisted in her denial, we ordered the torturer to proceed to the torture by jerks. He accordingly hoisted her ten feet from the ground, and when there we enjoined her to tell the truth. But whether she would not or could not speak, she answered only by a motion of the head, indicating that she could say nothing. Seeing which, we made a sign to the executioner to let go the rope, and she fell with all her weight from the height of ten feet to that of two feet. Her arms from the shock were dislocated from their sockets, she uttered a loud cry, and swooned away. We again caused water to be dashed in her face. She returned to herself and again cried out, "'Infamous assassins! You are killing me, but were you to tear out my arms, I would tell you nothing else!' Upon this, we ordered a weight of fifty pounds to be fastened to her feet. But at this moment the door opened and many voices cried, "'Enough! Enough! Uh, do not torture her any more!' These voices were those of Giacomo, Bernardo, and Lucrezia Petroni. The judges, perceiving the obstinacy of Beatrice, had ordered that the accused, who had been separated for five months, should be confronted. They advanced into the torture chamber, and seeing Beatrice hanging by the wrists, her arms disjointed and covered with blood, Giacomo cried out, "'The sin is committed. Nothing further remains but to save our souls by repentance. Undergo death courageously, and not suffer you to be thus tortured.' Then Beatrice said, shaking her head as if to cast off grief, "'Do you then wish to die? Since you wish it, be it so.' Then turning to the officers, "'Untie me,' said she. "'Read the examination to me, and what I have to confess, I will confess. What I have to deny, I will deny.' Beatrice was then lowered and untied. A barber reduced the dislocation of her arms in the usual manner. The examination was read over to her, and as she had promised, she made a full confession. After this confession, at the request of the two brothers, they were all confined in the same prison. But the next day, Giacomo and Bernardo were taken to the cells of Torninona. As for the women, they remained where they were. End of part two of the Sensi. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section twenty two of Celebrated Crimes, Volume One by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three of the Sensi. The Pope was so horrified on reading the particulars of the crime contained in the confessions that he ordered the culprits to be dragged by wild horses through the streets of Rome. But so barbarous a sentence shocked the public mind, so much so that many persons of princely rank petitioned the Holy Father on their knees, imploring him to reconsider his decree, or at least allow the accused to be heard in their defense. "'Tell me,' replied Clement VIII, "'did they give their unhappy father time to be heard in his own defense when they slew him in so merciless and degrading a fashion?' At length, overcome by so many entreaties, he respited them for three days. The most eloquent and skillful advocates in Rome immediately busied themselves in preparing pleadings for so emotional a case, and on the day fixed for hearing appeared before his holiness. The first pleader was Niccolo degli Angeli, who spoke with such force and eloquence that the Pope, 
alarmed at the effect he was producing among the audience, passionately interrupted him. "'Are there then to be found?' he indignantly cried, "'among the Roman nobility, children capable of killing their parents, and among Roman lawyers, men capable of speaking in their defense. This is a thing we should never have believed, nor even a moment supposed it plausible.' All were silent upon this terrible rebuke, except Farinacci, who, nerving himself with a strong sense of duty, replied respectfully but firmly, "'Most holy father, we are not here to defend criminals, but to save the innocent, for if we succeed in proving that any of the accused acted in self-defense, I hope that they will be exonerated in the eyes of your holiness, for just as the law provides for cases in which the father may legally kill the child, so this holds good in the converse.' We will therefore continue our pleadings on receiving leave from your holiness to do so. Clement the Eighth then showed himself as patient as he had previously been hasty, and heard the argument of Farinacci, who pleaded that Francesco Sensi had lost all the rights of a father from the day that he violated his daughter. In support of his contention he wished to put, in the memorial sent by Beatrice to his holiness, petitioning him, as her sister had done, to remove her from the paternal roof and place her in a convent. Unfortunately, this petition had disappeared, and notwithstanding the minutest search among the papal documents, no trace of it could be found. The Pope had all the pleadings collected and dismissed the advocates who then retired, excepting Daltieri, who kneeled before him, saying, "'Most Holy Father, I humbly ask pardon for appearing before you in this case, but I had no choice in the matter being the advocate of the poor.' The Pope kindly raised him, saying, "'Go.' We are not surprised at your conduct, but at that of others who protect and defend criminals. As the Pope took a great interest in this case, he sat up all night over it, studying it with Cardinal de San Marcello, a man of such acumen and great experience in criminal cases. Then, having summed it up, he sent a draft of his opinion to the advocates, who read it with great satisfaction, and entertained hopes that the lives of the convicted persons would be spared, for the evidence all went to prove that even if the children had taken their father's life, all the provocation came from him, and that Beatrice in particular had been dragged into the part she had taken in this crime by the tyranny, wickedness, and brutality of her father. Under the influence of these considerations, the Pope mitigated the severity of their prison life, and even allowed the prisoners to hope that their lives would not be forfeited. Amidst the general feeling of relief afforded to the public by these favors, another tragical event changed the papal mind and frustrated all his humane intentions. This was the atrocious murder of the Marchese di Santa Croce, a man seventy years of age by his son Paolo, who stabbed him with a dagger in fifteen or twenty places, because the father would not promise to make Paolo his sole heir. The murderer fled and escaped. Clement the Eighth was horror-stricken at the increasing frequency of this crime of parricide. For the moment, however, he was unable to take action, having to go to Monte Cavallo to consecrate a cardinal titular bishop in the church of Santa Maria degli Angeli. But the day following, on Friday the 10th of September, 1599, at eight o'clock in the morning, he summoned Monsignor Taverna, governor of Rome, and said to him, "'Monsignor, we place in your hands the Sensi case, that you may carry out the sentence as speedily as possible.' On his return to his palace, after leaving His Holiness, the governor convened a meeting of all the criminal judges in the city, the result of the council being that all the Sensi were condemned to death. The final sentence was immediately known— and as this unhappy family inspired a constantly increasing interest, many cardinals spent the whole of the night either on horseback or in their carriages making interest that, at least so far as the women were concerned, they should be put to death privately and in the prison, and that a free pardon should be granted to Bernardo, a poor lad only fifteen years of age, who, guiltless of any participation in the crime, yet found himself involved in its consequences. The one who interested himself most in the case was Cardinal Sforza, who nevertheless failed to elicit a single gleam of hope, so obdurate was his holiness. At length, Farinacci, working on the papal conscience, succeeded after long and urgent entreaties, and only at the last moment, that the life of Bernardo should be spared. From Friday evening, the members of the Brotherhood of the uh, Conforteria had gathered at the two prisons of Corte Savella and uh, Turinona. The preparations for the closing scene of the tragedy had occupied workmen on the bridge of St. Angelo all night and it was not till five o'clock in the morning that the registrar entered the cell of Lucrezia and Beatrice to read their sentences to them. Both were sleeping, calm in the belief of a reprieve. The registrar woke them and told them that, judged by man, they must now prepare to appear before God. Beatrice was at first thunderstruck. 
she seemed paralyzed and speechless. Then she rose from bed and staggered as if intoxicated, recovered her speech, uttering despairing cries. Lucrezia heard the tidings with more firmness and proceeded to dress herself to go to the chapel, exhorting Beatrice to resignation, but she, raving, wrung her hands and struck her head against the wall, shrieking, To die! To die! Am I to die unprepared on a scaffold? On a gibbet? My God! My God! This fit led to a terrible paroxysm, after which the exhaustion of her body enabled her mind to recover its balance, and from that moment she became an angel of humility and an example of resignation. Her first request was for a notary to make her will. This was immediately complied with, and on his arrival she dictated its provisions with much calmness and precision. Its last clause desired her internment in the church of San Pietro in Montorio, for which she always had a strong attachment, as it commanded a view of her father's palace. She bequeathed five hundred crowns to the nuns of the Order of the Stigmata, and ordered that her dowry, amounting to fifteen thousand crowns, should be distributed in marriage portions to fifty poor girls. She selected the foot of the high altar as the place where she wished to be buried, over which hung the beautiful picture of the transfiguration so often admired by her during her life. Following her example, Lucrezia in her turn disposed of her property. She desired to be buried in the church of San Giorgio di Villobre, and left thirty-two thousand crowns to charities with other pious legacies. Having settled their earthly affairs, they joined in prayer, reciting psalms, litanies, and the prayers for the dying. At eight o'clock they confessed, heard mass, and received the sacraments, after which Beatrice, observing to her stepmother that the rich dresses they wore were out of place on a scaffold, ordered two to be made in nun's fashion, and that is to say, uh, gathered at the neck with long, wide sleeves. That for Lucrezia was made of black cotton stuff, Beatrice's of taffetas. In addition, she had a small black turban made to place on her head. These dresses with cords for girdles were brought to them, and they were placed on a chair while the women continued to pray. The time appointed being near at hand, they were informed that their last moment was approaching. Then Beatrice, who was still on her knees, rose with a tranquil and almost joyful countenance. "'Mother,' said she, "'the moment of our suffering is impending. I think we had better dress in these clothes, and help one another at our toilet for the last time.' They then put on the dresses provided, girt themselves with the cords. Beatrice placed her turban on her head, and they awaited the last summons. In the meantime, Giacomo and Bernardo, whose sentences had been read to them, awaited also the moment of their death. About ten o'clock the members of the Confraternity of Mercy, a Florentine order, arrived at the prison of Tordenona and halted on the threshold with the crucifix, awaiting the appearance of the unhappy youths. Here a serious accident had nearly happened. As many persons were at the prison windows to see the prisoners come out, someone accidentally threw down a large flower-pot full of earth which fell into the street and narrowly missed one of the confraternity who was amongst the torch-bearers just before the crucifix. It passed so close to the torch as to extinguish the flame in its descent. At this moment the gates opened, and Giacomo appeared first on the threshold. He fell on his knees, adorning the holy crucifix with great devotion. He was completely covered with a large mourning cloak, under which his bare breast was prepared to be torn by the red-hot pincers of the executioner, which were lying ready in a chafing-dish fixed to the cart. Having ascended the vehicle in which the executioner placed him so as more readily to perform his office, Bernardo came out and was thus addressed on his appearance by the fiscal of Rome. Signor Bernardo Sensi, in the name of our blessed Redeemer, our Holy Father the Pope spares your life, with the sole condition that you accompany your relatives to the scaffold and to their death, and never forget to pray for those with whom you were condemned to die. At this unexpected intelligence, a loud murmur of joy spread among the crowd, and the members of the confraternity immediately untied the mask which covered the youth's eyes, for, owing to his tender age, it had been thought proper to conceal the scaffold from his sight. Then the executioner, having disposed of Giacomo, came down from the cart to take Bernardo, whose pardon being formally communicated to him, he took off his handcuffs and placed him alongside his brother, covering him up with a magnificent cloak embroidered with gold for the neck and shoulders of the poor lad had been already bared as a preliminary to his decapitation. People were surprised to see such a rich cloak in the possession of the executioner, but were told that it was the one given by Beatrice to Marzio, to pledge him to the murder of her father, which fell to the executioner as a, a perquisite after the execution of the assassin. The sight of the great assemblage of people produced such an effect upon the boy that he fainted. The procession then proceeded to the prison of Corte Savella, marching to the sound of funeral chants. At its gates the sacred crucifix halted for the women to join. 
They soon appeared, fell on their knees, and worshipped the holy symbol as the others had done. The march to the scaffold was then resumed. The two female prisoners followed the last row of penitents in a single file, veiled to the waist, with the distinction that Lucrezia, as a widow, wore a black veil and high-heeled slippers of the same hue, with bows of ribbon as was the fashion, whilst Beatrice, as a young unmarried girl, wore a silk flat cap to match her corsage, with a plush hood which fell over her shoulders and covered her violet frock. White slippers with high heels, ornamented with gold rosettes and cherry-colored fringe. The arms of both were untrammeled, except for a thin slack cord which left their hands free to carry a crucifix and a handkerchief. During the night a lofty scaffold had been erected on the bridge of St. Angelo, and the plank and block were placed thereon. Above the block was hung from a large crossbeam a ponderous axe, which, guided by two grooves, fell with its whole weight at the touch of a spring. In this formation the procession winded its way towards the bridge of St. Angelo. Lucrezia, the more broken down of the two, wept bitterly, but Beatrice was firmed and unmoved. On arriving at the open space before the bridge, the women were led into a chapel where they were shortly joined by Giacomo and Bernardo. They remained together for a few minutes, when the brothers were led away to the scaffold, although one was to be executed last and the other was pardoned. But when they had mounted the platform, Bernardo fainted a second time, and as the executioner was approaching to his assistance, some of the crowd, supposing that his object was to decapitate him, cried loudly, "'He is pardoned!' The executioner reassured them by seating Bernardo near the block, Giacomo kneeling on the other side. Then the executioner descended, entered the chapel, and reappeared leading Lucrezia, who was the first to suffer. At the foot of the scaffold he tied her hands behind her back, tore open the top of her corsage so as to uncover her shoulders, gave her the crucifix to kiss, and led her to the stepladder, which she ascended with great difficulty on account of her extreme stoutness. Then on reaching the platform he removed the veil which covered her head. On this exposure of her features to the immense crowd, Lucretia shuddered from head to foot. Then her eyes full of tears, she cried with a loud voice, "'Oh, my God, have mercy on me, and to you, brethren, a pray for my soul!' Having uttered these words, not knowing what was required of her, she turned to Alessandro, the chief executioner, and asked what she was to do. He told her to bestride the plank and lie prone upon it, which she did with great trouble and timidity. But as she was unable, on account of the fullness of her bust, to lay her neck upon the block, this had to be raised by placing a billet of wood underneath it. All this time the poor woman, suffering even more from shame than from fear, was kept in suspense. At length, when she was properly adjusted, the executioner touched the spring, and the knife fell, and the decapitated head, falling on the platform of the scaffold, bounded two or three times in the air, to the general horror. The executioner then seized it, showed it to the multitude, and... Wrapping it in black taffetas, placed it with the body on a bier at the foot of the scaffold. Whilst the arrangements were being made for the decapitation of Beatrice, several stands full of spectators broke down. Some people were killed by this accident, and still more lamed and injured. The machine being now rearranged and washed, the executioner returned to the chapel to take charge of Beatrice, who on seeing the sacred crucifix said some prayers for her soul, and on her hands being tied, cried out, God grant that you be binding this body into corruption, and loosing the soul unto life eternal. She then arose, proceeded to the platform, where she devoutly kissed the stigmata. Then, leaving her slippers at the foot of the scaffold, she nimbly ascended the ladder, and, instructed beforehand, promptly lay down on the plank without exposing her naked shoulders. But her precautions to shorten the bitterness of death were no avail, for the Pope, knowing her impetuous disposition and fearing lest she might be led into the commission of some sin between absolution and death, had given orders that the moment Beatrice was extended on the scaffold a signal gun should be fired from the castle of St. Angelo, which was done to the great astonishment of everybody, including Beatrice herself, who, not expecting this explosion, raised herself almost upright. The Pope, meanwhile, who was praying at Monte Cavallo, gave her absolution in articulo mortis. About five minutes thus passed, during which the sufferer waited with her head replaced on the block. At length, when the executioner judged that the absolution had been given, he released the spring and the axe fell. A gruesome sight was then afforded. Whilst the head bounced away on one side of the block, on the other the body rose erect as if about to step backwards. The executioner exhibited the head and disposed of it, and the body as before. He wished to place Beatrice's body with that of her stepmother, but the Brotherhood of Mercy took it out of his hands, and as one of them was attempting to lay it on the bier, it slipped from him and fell from the scaffold to the ground below, the dress being partially torn from the body, which was so besmeared with dust and blood that much time was occupied in washing it. 
Poor Bernardo was so overcome by this horrible scene that he swooned away for the third time, and it was necessary to revive him with stimulants to witness the fate of his elder brother. The turn of Giacomo at length arrived. He had witnessed the death of his stepmother and his sister, and his clothes were covered with their blood. The executioner approached him and tore off his cloak, exposing his bare breast covered with the wounds caused by the grip of red-hot pincers. In this state, and half-naked, he rose to his feet, turning to his brother, said, "'Bernardo, if in my examination I have compromised and accused you, I have done so falsely, and although I have already disavowed this declaration, I repeat, at the moment of appearing before God, that you are innocent, and that it is a cruel abuse of justice to compel you to witness this frightful spectacle.' The executioner then made him kneel down, bound his legs to one of the beams erected on the scaffold, and, having bandaged his eyes, shattered his head with a blow of his mallet. Then, in the sight of all, he hacked his body into four quarters. The official party then left, taking with them Bernardo, who, being in a state of high fever, was bled and put to bed. The corpses of the two ladies were laid out, each on its bier, under the statue of St. Paul at the foot of the bridge, with four torches of white wax, which burned till four o'clock in the afternoon. Then, along with the remains of Giacomo, they were taken to the church of San Giovanni del Calato. Finally, about nine in the evening, the body of Beatrice, covered with flowers and attired in the dress worn at her execution, was carried to the church of San Pietro in Montorio, with fifty lighted torches, and followed by the brethren of the Order of the Stigmata and all the Franciscan monks in Rome. There, agreeably to her wish, it was buried at the foot of the high altar. The same evening, Signora Lucrezia was interred as she had desired to be in the church of San Giorgio di Velobre. All Rome may be said to have been present at this tragedy, carriages, horses, foot people, and cars crowding as it were upon one another. The day was unfortunately so hot, and the sun so scorching, that many persons fainted, others returned home stricken with fever, and some even died during the night, owing to sunstroke from exposure during the three hours occupied by the execution. The Tuesday following, the 14th of September, being the Feast of the Holy Cross, the Brotherhood of San Marcello, by special license of the Pope, set at liberty the unhappy Bernardo Sensi, with the condition of paying within the year 2,500 Roman crowns to the Brotherhood of the Most Holy Trinity of Pope Sixtus, as may be found today recorded in their archives. Having now seen the tomb, if you desire to form a more vivid impression of the principal actors in this tragedy than can be derived from a narrative, pay a visit to the Barberini Gallery, where you will see, with five other masterpieces by Guido, the portrait of Beatrice, taken, some say, the night before her execution, others during her progress to the scaffold. It is the head of a lovely girl, wearing a headdress composed of a turban with a lappet. The hair is of a rich, fair chestnut hue, the dark eyes are moistened with recent tears. A perfectly framed nose surmounts an infantile mouth. Unfortunately, the loss of tone in the picture, since it was painted, has destroyed the original fair complexion. The age of the subject may be twenty or perhaps twenty-two years. Near this portrait is that of Lucrezia Petrani. The small head indicates a person below the middle height. The attributes are those of a Roman matron in her pride, her high complexion, graceful contour, straight nose, black eyebrows, and expression, at the same time imperious and voluptuous, indicate this character to life. A smile still seems to linger on the charming dimpled cheeks and perfect mouth mentioned by the chronicler, and her face is exquisitely framed by luxuriant curls falling from her forehead in graceful profusion. As for Giacomo and Bernardo, as no portraits of them are in existence, we are obliged to gather an idea of their appearance from the manuscript which has enabled us to compile this sanguinary history. They are thus described by the eyewitnesses of the closing scene. Giacomo was short, well-made, and strong. With black hair and beard, he appeared to be about twenty-six years of age. Poor Bernardo was the image of his sister, so nearly resembling her that when he mounted the scaffold his long hair and girlish face led people to suppose him to be Beatrice herself. He might be fourteen or fifteen years of age. The peace of God be with them. End of Part 3 of the Sensi End of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 By Alexandre Dumas Translated by George Burnham Ives Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.